A Century of Change Negro League Centennial Celebration. Presented by Hush Blackwell and Robert and Marlise Gorley. The thing that I find, and it's very fascinating and it's sometimes difficult to talk about, is that we asked for integration. What we wanted was equality. The two are not the same. So this story is a wonderful, rich story on the importance of economic empowerment, an unprecedented level of leadership, and then the social advancement of our country alongside 2,600 men and women who could play. They just wanted to play. They didn't know they were doing all this other stuff. They didn't care about that. But what they were doing and the sacrifice that they made in their love of the game of baseball changed this game. And it changed our country for the better. When the Civil War was over, baseball gained great popularity. Black baseball players and teams competed at all levels of play open to them. It was not a new phenomena for black folks to be playing baseball. We've been playing baseball for quite some time and playing professional baseball at some level for quite some time. There are even some evidences of us playing baseball as slaves. And, and so the ideology of black folks playing baseball is not new. Having it have an organized structure, however, was. In the post-war black community, baseball was a natural extension of the growing cultural and social networks that included schools, churches, theaters, and newspapers. First all-black team was the Philadelphia Pythians, made of black professionals out of Philadelphia. And they played for about three or four years. So when we start going back and looking at those who played and we start talking about the likes of Moses Fleetwood Walker, who was the first known black to play on what we would consider to be a major league baseball team. This is the late 1800s, about 1883. Baseball has been an arena for racial issues in America since the Civil War. In 1867, white owners and managers of organized baseball made a gentleman's agreement to keep dark-skinned people out of their league. It was essentially a way of just basically polarizing our sport. The thing that strikes me is that there was no written doctrine. It was just a verbalized agreement amongst players, managers, and owners that essentially said, if you allow a black to play with you, you can't play with us. The unwritten gentleman's agreement was strong enough to prevent most blacks from playing integrated professional baseball for the remainder of the 19th century. The problem with establishing strong black teams or black league was a lack of economic power. So we were handicapped in that we had to rely on white owners and their ballparks to play in. And we had to pay them a fee. Local promoters who control ballparks charge 10% of the gate for games played in their parks. Scheduling and organizing league games required far more planning than barnstorming. The Negro Leaguers were heralded barnstormers. They took baseball into Canada. They were oftentimes the first Americans to play in many Spanish-speaking countries. Believe it or not, it was a touring team of Negro Leaguers that introduced professional baseball to the Japanese going all the way back to 1927. The tour was so successful that several years later, Babe Ruth and his all-stars would get invited over. And, and see, they've been commonly credited with having taken professional baseball to the Japanese, but it's not true. No, it was that team called the Philadelphia Royal Giants. In the 1920s, Negro League teams played only about 33% of their games against other league teams. The rest they played on the road, barnstorming in distant cities to make extra money and to help make ends meet. More times than not, it was these guys going into towns, playing the local town team or whomever they could and strike up a game and then split the purse kind of thing. Barnstorming tour. Oh man, it was outstanding as far as money making one. So and we were making $100 a night. Wow. And my wife, man, you must be stealing. <laughs> <laughs> and when they're going through and barnstorming these different towns, especially these small Western towns where in a period 
when cinema was still in its infancy and there wasn't really radio yet and there certainly wasn't television, it was things like the circus and the carnival and these road shows coming to town that was everybody's entertainment. So it wasn't just a baseball game. You know, the players also played musical instruments and or wrestled or put on comedy routines, right? This was a it was a three-act show, you know, that, that the baseball game was just part of. In April 1917, the United States entered World War I. The need for men and women to work in factories accelerated the migration of blacks from the South. Within three years, around half a million blacks had moved northward to perform essential war-related jobs. In theory, the view that democracy could not be unconditional abroad and conditional at home made sense. But in reality, racism continued and blacks met even greater hostility after the war. Northern labor unions, which refused to accept blacks, stood by as industry cast them out of their wartime jobs by the thousands. In 1919, the year the world made safe for democracy, there were at least 25 race riots in America. We had some great independent black teams before 1920. The Indianapolis ABCs, the Philadelphia Giants, uh, the smart set out of Patterson, New Jersey. Rube Foster could see that they were drawing a lot of people. Rube Foster dominated the black baseball scene. He beefed up the Chicago American Giants by rating the rival ABCs and other teams of their best players. He thought that he could create a league that would be so dynamic that he would essentially force Major League Baseball's hand to expand. Foster was ready to carry out his vision of a National Negro League. He wanted to force white promoters out of the black game and to force the white major leagues to accept some manner of integration. He thought if he organized the players, the National League would take a black team and the American League would take a black team. Mm -hmm. And there had been some efforts to create a Negro League, but they failed until 1920. On February 13, 1920, the owners of the top black clubs in the Midwest gathered at the Paseo YMCA in Kansas City at the invitation of Rube Foster for the purpose of forming a league. The original meeting was supposed to take place in Indianapolis, and the meeting was canceled, thankfully. Rube Foster was elected president, and the Constitution for the National Association of Colored Professional Baseball Clubs was written. And it's not surprising that it happens in Kansas City. Um, Kansas City would have been a very important market. It would have been important for them to have had a franchise placed here. J.L. Wilkinson, the owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, he was unique in that he was the only white owner of the original charter members. J.L. Wilkinson was a 2,000 man in the 1900s. And when I say that is the fact that J.L. Wilkinson really did not see color. He saw these great ball players. He made his entire living in black baseball. He was good to the team. It wasn't just this was a good business thing, no, but I won't. No, I no. don't want to, well, you know, see, socialize with the players. Probably, when my life, Jill Wilson probably was the second man that I'd ever known without prejudice. First was my dad, and then Jill Wilkinson. So Rue kept hearing these great things about Wilkinson, but the other thing that Rue needed that Wilkinson had was access to stadiums, and so Rue relented. Wilkinson would become secretary of the Negro Leagues, bring in his Kansas City Monarchs, who would then go on to become one of the greatest baseball franchises, not in Negro Leagues history, but in baseball history. J.L. Wilkinson was able to keep his Kansas City Monarchs alive by cultivating the widespread corridor of the game venues that ran from Minnesota and the Dakotas down to Oklahoma and Texas, as well as in Canada and Mexico. Certainly, the, the monarchs are going to become um, a cultural symbol of, of the community. Uh, by the 1930s and 40s, uh, opening day is, is practically a holiday. I mean, businesses in the black community shut down. The Kansas City Monarchs set a standard of excellence for the Negro Leagues. The monarchs, who had a special relationship with their home community, were looked to as leaders and role models for the urban youth. Even when the gate receipts weren't great during the Depression, the Monarchs were always a solid club. They, if they weren't going to win the pennant that year, they were in contention. In 1934, a black all-star team built around the Kansas City Monarch players 
was sent to the Orient for 13 months on a baseball extravaganza that took the team to Hawaii, the Philippines, Hong Kong, and Japan. Wherever you had successful black baseball, you had thriving black economies. It wasn't just players that were being uh, hired, were being employed. Uh, you have the ticket takers and the concessionaires and the bus drivers and grounds crew and all these other attendant jobs. Uh, you also had the restaurants and, and the taverns and so forth in the neighborhood that on game days would see their business pick up considerably. By the end of the decade, black owners had created a successful business that employed about 500 people about 75% of that income flow back into the black community. Baseball was established as a profession for blacks, as a parallel institution to the white major leagues. For the black community, the Negro Leagues were a source of pride and a model of achievement for the world to see. This area was jumping, but this was, the, this was a cultural crossroads where jazz and baseball intersected. And here were these great stars who were a major influence on this. And so what Negro Leagues Baseball did for those black businesses was it brought in a built-in clientele that helped those black-owned businesses flourish. I do think there may be some tendency to think of this as being small businesses. And that was certainly true. I mean, there was all sorts of that. We're also talking about medium and large scale business. Insurance firms, law firms, uh, we're talking about publishing houses, kind of filling all sections of an internal parallel economy. My dollar was spent here. And this is the only place I could spend a dollar. Because if I went downtown, they wouldn't let me try on clothes. They wouldn't let me eat in the restaurant. So why deal with that when I can just stay right here Everything's within walking distance and not have to deal with the atrocities of racism. Many of the same people who cheered the talented players on the field refused to serve their food or pump their gas between games. Lodging became so difficult that the monarchs gave up hotels and relied on black boarding houses and private homes. The baseball field was their sanctuary, man. I get to show you what I can do. Uh-huh but it was the traveling the highways and byways of our country that where the difficulty came in, not knowing where you could stop and get something to eat or have a place to stay. Early in the decade, teams traveled almost exclusively by trains. Some were forced to travel in segregated railroad cars. Others rented or purchased their own Pullman cars. As more roads were built across the country, automobiles and later buses provided teams with greater flexibility. Smaller communities became more accessible. Travel conditions for the ball players, for the most part, were difficult but not impossible. They knew how to navigate through sundown towns, as they're called. And so they would take sack lunches and, you know, fix a thermos of Kool-Aid. they drive up to a stream, wash their clothes out, hang them out the window of the bus and keep moving to the next town. So you, f you always find a way to navigate through the hatred, no matter where you are, because all you want to do is play baseball. That was it, that was Jim Crow, what could we do? We were a minority, we had no power, no economic power, no political power. You had to know when to shut up and make those baby steps and show white America on the field how professional that you really were. And, and to me, that's the transcending story of what the Negro Leagues represented. They never cried about the social injustice. They went out and did something about it. The great Hilton Smith, legendary pitcher, Hall of Fame pitcher for the Kansas City Monarchs, had recommended Jackie Robinson to J.O. Wilkinson. This is 1945. Robinson makes the team. Little did J.O. Wilkinson know that he just signed a man that was gonna put him out of business because by the end of the year, Robinson is gone. He's gone. He had literally vanished. His teammates had no idea where he was. Honestly, Robinson goes to meet with Branch Rickey. He really doesn't know the real reason that he's there. And that's when Rickey springs on him that he wants him to be the chosen one, the guy to break the color barrier in Major League Baseball. You were brought here to play with the Brooklyn organization. Montreal to start with. 
Think about that psychological barrier of a dark-skinned black man, just not any black man, but a dark-skinned black man who puts on a white uniform. He goes to a batter's box, picks up a bat made of white ass. He stands in a white chalk batter's box, standing over a white plate to hit a white baseball from a white pitcher between two white foul lines. And he runs to a white first base. Eight white fielders throw the ball to first base. A white umpire calls him safe route, and white fans boo or cheer. Talk about Babe Ruth. Yeah, Babe Ruth changed baseball. Jackie Robinson changed America. But you couldn't reduce this to just having a guy who was a great baseball player. You had to have a guy who could play, but you also had to have a guy who could handle the social aspect of this. Most of the ball players, African American ball players, are from the South, from the segregated South. Whereas you got Jackie Robinson, who grew up in an integrated community in Pasadena, California. He went to a predominantly white college. He was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army. So he already had this comfort zone of, of interacting with whites, where 90% of the other Negro League players had never interacted with whites because they grew up like me, never seeing a white face, except on TV. So he had the perfect blend of character and personality to integrate the game. And so Robinson holds the distinction of having broken the color barrier in what we deem to be the modern era of Major League Baseball. The impact of black baseball players in the Major Leagues was felt immediately. After Jackie Robinson received the newly created Rookie of the Year Award in 1947, black players won eight of the next 11 awards. Furthermore, nine of the 11 men voted the National League's most valuable player between 1949 and 1959 were former Negro League stars. Baseball would not be baseball without these Negro League products. That's the bottom line. If you were going to look at any one single solitary event that kind of triggered the movement to integrate Major League Baseball, World War II. Here you had the sentiment of these young black soldiers dying, fighting the same racism essentially in another country that we were being asked to accept here at home. And that is what started the sentiment, well, if they can die fighting for their country, why can't they play baseball in this country? Until the Civil Rights Movement came along, the movement was Negro League Baseball. Jackie integrated in 47, the military integrated in 1948, and then you got Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. So this happens before uh, Rosa Parks sits on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and Justice stood up in 1955. Uh, before Daisy Bates integrates Central High School in 1957, before the Civil Rights March in 63, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, Major League Baseball integrated before America was legally integrated. That's why it's so important. The Negro Leagues were successful in their quest to bring racial equality to the game of baseball. The victory was, however, bittersweet. Although Negro League managers wanted to continue their operations, they, like the players under contract with them, desired integration into the majors. To help bolster their club's dwindling financial situations, owners sold off some of their better players to the big league franchises for what little money the white owners offered, usually no more than several thousand dollars. So for that older black player, they had no chance now. So now the Negro League didn't want them because I can't sell you to the major leagues. The major leagues didn't want you because you own them. At the same time that integration's occurring and the wonderful aspects of that, you're also removing assets from the black community. And, and we see other examples of that as more businesses are hiring black workers, as more schools are accepting black students, as uh, there are more black foremen at plants. There becomes less of a societal uh, imperative within the black community to only buy local, right? Uh, it had been, don't shop where you can't work. We also see this happen at the same time that white flight is starting to take place uh, as white folks are moving out of um, these urban areas and into the suburbs, into Levitt towns and so forth. And, and African Americans are not allowed to, and other racial minorities are, are kept in the inner cities. Well, as, as the people are leaving, so are the plants. It was difficult for those smaller businesses to now compete 
with those mainstream businesses. Yeah, and, and, and so all of a sudden that would lead to the decline of so many African-American communities, including historic 18th and Vine. The Negro Lease found it very difficult to continue operation. Gimmicks such as clowning and hiring female players were tried in vain to bolster attendance. They were on life support and they knew it because their best players were not in the league anymore. Once you remove some of this talent and you remove the fan interest, you know, you're, you're scrambling to survive. It is ironic that the event that had been only dreamed of for 50 years would cause the demise of the now famous Negro League Baseball. The superstars of the Negro League signed with the major leagues and took their fans with them. And there was a sense that you didn't have to feel bad about it because it's all of everybody's game now. You know, we don't have to stick to just our teams. J.O. Wilkinson, who had Jackie Robinson here with the Kansas City Monarchs, sold his Kansas City Monarch to his business partner, T.Y. Barron, the year after Robinson takes the field. So I think the sentiment was there. I think everybody understood it wasn't a matter of if, it was simply a matter of when the Negro Leagues were going to die. The Negro National League disbanded after the 1948 season. The Negro American League absorbed some of the remaining franchises and divided the league into two divisions in an effort to bring back black baseball. Well, the leagues would go on to operate for another 13 years. Why? Because it took Major League Baseball 12 years before every Major League team had at least one black baseball player. The Boston Red Sox would become the last team to integrate in 1959 when they signed a guy by the name of Pumpsy Green. Now, there was still the team called the Kansas City Monarchs and still the team called the Indianapolis Clowns, and they were still out there barnstorming and trying to get a game however they could get a game. But black baseball in its organized capacity as we know it by 1960 had ended and was a thing of the past. And it, and it certainly ends with a whimper. And it, it's really a shame given how important a place the Monarchs have in baseball history. Not just black baseball history, but I mean, in overall, they are one of the consistently best teams that any league has ever produced, especially for the fairly limited time of their existence. Uh, the players that came out of this organization were second to none. Uh, not only some of the, the best players, but some of the most uh, colorful and entertaining and, and, and almost legendary ones. Guys like Satchel Paige and Cool Papa Bell. And, and of course, Jackie Robinson. Although the league struggled through to 1960, most historians agree that the 1948 season was the last year that the Negro Leagues were of major league quality. The reason why it ends the way it does, a lot of it has to do with the exploitative nature of how integration came about following World War II and moving into the 1950s. Robinson's breaking of the color barrier essentially sparked the civil rights movement in this country. And it triggered integration in a widespread fashion in this country because that's how popular baseball was. Admittance into the major leagues brought about the end of a sterling chapter in black history, the Negro Leagues. If there is indeed a bittersweet aspect to the overall story of the Negro Leagues, I think it lies directly with the fact that you can look at the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues or parallel the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues with the rise and fall of black economy in this country. And to a great extent, black economy never recovered from losing the Negro Leagues. What was good morally, what was good socially, was devastating economically and is always a cost for progress. Always. And it's also important to understand that things like desegregation and race relations aren't static. You know, it didn't all end in a day when, when Jackie Robinson got to play or when the Civil Rights Act was, was signed. These things are fluid. These things are constant. These things are still happening. And, and we haven't seen the end of the story. We have to understand athletes today, just like back there in the 50s, are truly the social change agents of America. What I learned from interviewing these, these great men is they had a pride in their self-esteem, uh, didn't make excuses. They were all, always respectful of their spouses. Uh, they would do anything for their children. This is what the 2020 should be about, respecting this history of these men who paved the way for these 
gangs that we have today. And they did it without protest or anger. They were the bridge over racial waters for Jackie Robinson. And the way it, it started, Horace Peterson, Black Archives, mm -hmm. came to Buck, come down to my office, we'll see. I said, okay, I got down. He said, I tell you what I want you to do, let's start a Negro Leagues Hall of Fame. I said, oh, no, Horace, we don't need a Negro League Hall of Fame. I think the guys that's qualified should go in the Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. What you, would you suggest? I said, Negro League Baseball Museum. And now it is our job to make sure that this is indeed a transcending history. And so as we embark on this centennial celebration, it is just that, an opportunity for us to elevate the awareness of what this history represents, again, both on and off the field. If you walk away from this story with nothing other than this, what the Negro League teaches us is very simple. In this great country of ours, if you dare to dream and you believe in yourself, you can do or be anything you want to be. A Century of Change Negro League Centennial Celebration, presented by Hush Blackwell and Robert and Marlise Gorley.